want to go ahead? Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the uh, first College of Science seminar of this academic year. Our speaker today is Professor Rachel Hill from the Cal Poly Pomona Department of History in the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences. I first learned about Professor Hill and her work and her expertise in the history of medicine in Africa when I made some inquiries with a history professor. I had learned several months ago that uh, the smallpox that the history of smallpox inoculation was a little more complicated than I first suspected. The inoculation had actually been introduced to the U.S. about almost, a little 300 and something years ago by a slave in Boston, and he had learned the technique in Africa. And I realized that vaccines, which are absolutely central to everything that's going on right now in our world, have a much more complicated past than I suspected. So I asked one of our other historians of science on campus if he could recommend a historian of science or medicine who knew anything about this. And he just happened to tell me that, oh, well, the university just recently hired someone. And that's Professor Hill, who's with us today. She joined Cal Poly Pomona in fall of 2020 in the middle of a pandemic, appropriately for the topic. She got her uh, PhD in history from Stanford, where she also won a teaching award as a teaching assistant. She taught at San Francisco State University for a bit before coming here. Um, she also graduated from San Francisco State with her bachelor's and master's in history. Her uh, dissertation research in history was based on, or focused on the history of medicine in Ethiopia in the 20th century. And she has studied and lived in Ethiopia to develop proficiency in the Amharic language. And she's published on bioprospecting, drug, dis drug discovery, and plant-based medicine. So um, with that, I will turn things over to Professor Hill. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thanks to everyone who uh, showed up today. So before I begin our story about smallpox inoculation and its introduction into colonial Boston by an enslaved West African, I, I thought I would say a few things about why a historian is over here talking to you in the College of Science and just sort of how I became interested in the history of science and medicine. So I was a history major at our sister CSU, San Francisco State, um, as an undergrad and a master's student. I was broadly interested in the history of European empire in Africa and beyond. And it was through encounters with literature on the histories of health and medicine in colonial and post-colonial Africa that I learned that how people understand the body historically, how people understand disease and wellness, how they go about restoring their health and well-being, and how the state intervenes in those practices are lines of inquiry that can actually be quite productive in highlighting much broader historical processes. So in other words, what I learned is that histories of health, science, and medicine are always about so much more besides. They reveal things about governance, economies, social relations, and the politics of knowledge. And it's for me, these last two social relations and the politics of knowledge, that is to say, who has power in society, whose voice is quiet or even perhaps absent in the archive, who, you know, how do we know what we know and who gets to say what knowledge is, are questions that really guided my research as a graduate student. So when I began studying the history of 20th century Ethiopia's efforts to regulate so-called traditional medicine in the 20th century, I began interviewing traditional healers as well as chemists and botanists and pharmacists. And it was through that experience that I <clears throat> learned that doing the histories of health, science and medicine lends itself necessarily to an interdisciplinary approach. So to talk about the history of health, for example, you have to engage with the science to some degree. At least it's helpful to have a working knowledge of disciplines outside the humanities. And for my own work, understanding things about <clears throat> epidemiology, that is the study of patterns, causes, and effects of health and disease have been really useful. 
Um, I've also, as I mentioned, you know, had the opportunity to engage with fields like chemistry and botany. So I found that this was also a really invigorating space for science and the humanities to meet. And as an educator, bringing histories of health science and medicine into the classroom has allowed me to have really productive discussions across fields, um, particularly with students in the STEM fields who I've had the great pleasure of watching over the course of an academic term, develop a sincere appreciation for how the humanities approaches questions around science and technology. So this kind of interdisciplinary space I find really intellectually invigorating. And so I'm hoping to have some of those cross-disciplinary discussions in our Q&A. So to begin with our story here about smallpox inoculation, I'm actually gonna start us off in November of 1721 in early colonial Boston, when someone threw a homemade explosive through the window of the home of a local Boston Puritan minister named Cotton Mather. Now attached to the explosive, which fortunately for the minister did not detonate, um, was a note that said, Cotton Mather, you dog, damn you, I'll inoculate you with this, with a pox to you. Now this was the response to Cotton Mather's active promotion of inoculation for the disease smallpox. Inoculation is the method of introducing some material from a sick person's smallpox blister into an open cut of a healthy person so that they might hopefully contract a mild case of the disease and then develop immunity thereafter. Now, this was a very poorly understood medical technology in colonial America and Europe. And this method that Cotton Mab had been actively promoting around Boston, as well as in correspondence with physician scientists in England, had been taught to him by an enslaved African man who he owned as property. The man whom he called Onesimus had learned this preventative medical technique in his homeland, likely somewhere in what is today Ghana, West Africa. So smallpox deaths were really common in colonial Boston. And when this unexploded homemade grenade flew through Cotton Mather's house window, a smallpox epidemic was raging. Um, this particular smallpox epidemic that hit Boston in 1721 was one of the most deadly epidemics of the century in colonial America, but also it was the catalyst for the first major application of preventative inoculation in the North American colonies. Now, this method of inoculation taught to colonial Bostonians by an enslaved African in many ways laid the foundation for modern techniques of infectious disease prevention. And the contentious public debate that accompanied the introduction of what was at the time a very poorly understood medical technology has some very interesting similarities to contemporary misunderstandings about vaccination. Also, I'm particularly fascinated with this story because of how it reveals the relationship between power and knowledge, which as I mentioned, is sort of an interest of mine, right? So whose medical knowledge is considered scientific? Who gets to be an expert? Who is an arbiter of that, right? Like who decides what is good medical practice and what isn't? As I've already mentioned, I find the answers to those kinds of questions to be quite you know, revealing of certain poignant things about the nature of power in the production of scientific knowledge. So before we continue this story in colonial Boston, I think it's worthwhile to say a few things about smallpox. So we all know what we're talking about here. Um, it's an infectious disease um, caused by one of two virus variants, both called va variola. Um, it's a very old disease, and it's an old world disease, meaning that it was not endemic to the Americas, right? So the earliest evidence we have is from um, mummified human remains found in Egypt. The risk of death after contracting the disease was about 30%, but the risk went up considerably um, for vulnerable populations. So small children and babies were particularly vulnerable. And it initially causes feelings of malaise, fever, aches, 
vomiting, but a skin rash then develops, which turns, of course, into these fluid filled pustules and people who survive, if, if you're lucky enough to survive, you tended to have severe scarring, disfigurement and sometimes even blindness. So this was really quite a dreaded um, disease. And historians tend to agree that the, the spread of smallpox globally is related to the growth of human populations and increased mobility and exploration. So certainly the expansion of trade routes over the centuries um, seems to have led to the spread globally. Some sort of watershed moments that historians have marked is um, the seventh century Arab expansion when it seems to have brought smallpox into parts of Northern Africa, Spain and Portugal. Um, the eighth century expansion of the Trans-Saharan caravan trade, of course, which was linked to Mediterranean sea trade routes, which were linked to even larger land-based trade routes. And then by the 15th century, you have Portugal occupying parts of Western Africa, um, and you see smallpox outbreaks related to those inter interchanges. And then by the 16th century, large, uh, significant number of European settlers began settling in the Americas. Of course, also this is the time when shiploads of enslaved African captives are also arriving in the Americas. And this brings smallpox to the Caribbean, Central America, and South America. By the 17th century, you see European settlers and the ongoing importation of enslaved Africans bringing smallpox to North America. And I should mention that this, of course, has really devastating effects for the indigenous population in the Americas because this was not an endemic disease. So folks who didn't have any prior exposure were particularly, this was a particularly lethal pathogen for them. So just in terms of tech terminology so that we know um, the differences between inoculation versus vaccination, um, I know that this is the College of Science, but I'm not assuming that you're all um, you know, that, that you're all in the medical sciences. For, for, um, so inoculation is a word that actually comes to us via Europeans, even though the practice is much older. Um, so in the 15th century, Europeans would use this term to refer to grafting a bud on a, um, onto another plant. Um, and so when they encountered a method that was known in Africa and Asia that involved transferring part of a smallpox blister onto a healthy person, they called it inoculation. Um, to make things even more confusing, it's sometimes used interchangeably with variolation because variola was the virus that caused smallpox. You will sometimes see um, these terms used interchangeably in the literature, which of course all differs from the modern um, term vaccination, which I will return to later on in the story about sort of how we got this term. But a vaccine typically is injected, typically. Um, it contains an agent that resembles a disease causing microorganism. It can be made, of course, from weakened or killed forms of the microbe, or in the case of the COVID-19 vaccine, right, it's made from one of the surface proteins. So to return to our story of smallpox in Boston, it was nothing new to colonial Boston. Um, it arrived with the great influx of Europeans in the mid 17th century and came back repeatedly, sometimes killing hundreds of people each time. Um, some might say it was the most dreaded disease in colonial America because infectious disease was so poorly understood at the time. Um, and you know, certainly for indigenous Americans who had no prior exposure, but also there just weren't a lot of things that people knew to do for it, right? So um, local leaders did have some public health policies, um, burying the dead really quickly, flying red flags over the houses so that you would know that someone was infected there, so don't come visit, requiring ships with sick sailors to stop at an island in Boston Harbor and quarantine. But generally speaking, most colonial Bostons, uh, Bostonians knew that the next epidemic was just, you know, just over the horizon, right? And certainly in 1721, um, this ship arrives from the British West Indies with smallpox on board. And despite attempts to quarantine the outbreak, you have community spread and a full-blown epidemic. 
Now, if you've ever been forced to study early colonial America or the witch trials, the Salem witch trials, maybe you've heard of Cotton Mather before. He was a very influential person in colonial Boston. And Cotton Mather had, in many ways, been waiting and preparing for this moment in 1721, because this Puritan minister of Salem witch trial fame was um, given this West African man as a quote unquote gift uh, from his congregation, this man who he called Onesimus. And he asked him if he'd ever been, ever had smallpox, if he'd ever contracted smallpox. And Onesimus explains to him, uh, yes and no. And then goes on to explain that he had been inoculated with a small amount of smallpox, but had left him immune to the disease, right? And if you're thinking that this is sort of odd, it was actually a common question to ask. Um, in fact, you'll even see newspaper advertisements um, for enslaved Africans, either advertising that they'd been prior, priorly exposed and had had smallpox, enslaved Africans who bore the scars of, of smallpox that could prove that they had had it before could even fetch a higher price on the market. So you will see sometimes in these new newspaper ads, you know, basically just them suggesting that there are ways in which these enslaved Africans have been cleared of having smallpox. So this wasn't sort of an odd question for him to ask. And so in his response, of course, Mather's quite fascinated and he begins to ask for more details and Onesimus provides him and shows him the scar and explains the process of inoculation as it was practiced on land in what is today Ghana. And how do we know that? <laughs> how do we know that it was probably today Ghana? Well, in terms of what we know about Onesimus, unfortunately, we know frustratingly little, right? Which is common for enslaved individuals. Um, lived, the lived experience of marginalization often translates into being marginalized in historical narratives, right? Enslaved people don't show up in the archives as much. We know that he was first documented as having lived in um, colonial Boston in 1706, which of course was the year that Cotton Mather's congregation purchased him as a gift for Cotton Mather. And we know that Cotton Mather refers to him as Guru Monty. So I should say a few things about that term. Um, Coromonte, Coromontine, and all of these various misspellings are derived from the name of a slaving fort in the town of Coromonte, Ghana, what is today Ghana, what then would have been called the Gold Coast. And Coromonte and all of its various derivations becomes the English name for enslaved Africans generally of the Akan ethnicity from what is today Ghana and the Gold Coast. So we also know that people who were known to their enslavers as Coromonte were often taken prisoner during a series of wars between the Fonte and Asante states in West Africa which means that many of the so-called Coromonte slaves were in fact military captives with training and experience. And several of them in fact used their leadership and tactical skills to organize revolts in the British Caribbean. So if anybody's interested, you could literally just Google Coromonte wars and see these various kinds of revol revolts that have been traced directly to individuals who had this kind of tactical military training in West Africa. We also know that people of the Akan ethnicity were often captured and sent to the British Caribbean, like Jamaica, during the Asante Fonte Wars. So there's a, we all, and then we also know that um, Onesimus spent time in the Caribbean before he arrived in Boston. So there's a better than average chance that he was in fact a veteran of the Asante Fonte Wars, although he could also have been a civilian captive in any case, many enslaved Africans coming from that point of embarkation um, to the New World were referred to as Coromonte, um, which sort of leaves unclear their specific cultural affiliations, but we know broadly the general region where they would have come from. And we also know that he purchased his own freedom in 1716. So this is actually before the 1721 epidemic hit. 
So he was able to save up enough of his wages from work that he did while enslaved within Cotton Mather's household to purchase his own freedom from Cotton Mather. And it seems that he never returned. So by the time the smallpox epidemic of 1721 hit, Onesimus is no longer <clears throat> enslaved in Cotton Mather's household and he kind of drops off of the historical record and we're not really entirely sure what happens after that. In terms of his knowledge of inoculation, this is not at all surprising. Um, as I mentioned, inoculation was widely practiced in Africa, but also China and India, um, parts of Eurasia actually um, that were under the Ottoman Empire. You also see this practice. And in terms of its widespread dispersal in pre-colonial Africa, there are two main sources for information about this um, and they rely on European accounts. So I would be happy to say a few things about that in the Q&A, but the two sources we have are mainly from European travelers accounts. And then for the 19th century, you also see missionary accounts who document this practice, right? I would suggest as an Africanist historian that the practice is likely far older than this because Europeans really could not penetrate the interior of Africa until the 19th century. They were not militarily superior and they did not have malaria prophylaxis until the 19th century. So, you know, relying on European accounts means that we're relying on them being able to actually observe this practice, which most of them wouldn't have been able to do prior to the 19th century. So I would suggest that it's likely a far older practice than the 18th and 19th century. Um, and I'm happy to sort of talk more about that in the Q&A if anyone's interested. Just so you can kind of see a map of the distribution of where these practices are in Africa, or I should probably say where we have evidence of them. Um, you'll notice that there's a lot in the Eastern part of Africa. For our discussion today, the points that interest us are the ones that I've circled in red, right? Because individuals from East Africa were not involved in the transatlantic slave system. So they wouldn't have likely have been captured and, and brought across the Atlantic. However, we do have documentation of these practices in Senegambia, the Gold Coast area, what is today Ghana, and also Northern Nigeria. And that certainly corresponds to two of the largest um, slaving ports in West Africa. So these are showing you where the majority of Africans were taken from um, who ended up in the Americas, right? And I'll also just mention here that it's also a distinct possibility that enslaved Africans learned this technique from other enslaved Africans. So in other words, um, I'll call your attention to West Central Africa, which is actually um, the region where the majority of African captives came from um, who ended up in the Americas. Yet we don't have evidence of pre-colonial West Central Africans practicing inoculation practices. Right. Um, however, it's it's entirely likely, and again, I'm happy to say more about why I think this in the Q and A. If anyone's interested, that Africans learned this technique from other enslaved Africans who did come from regions where this was practiced. So, getting back to Cotton Mather and the controversy in Boston, once he inquires um, about this practice, um, he begins investigating. Um, other enslaved Africans in Boston, and he finds that they too have the marks of inoculation. And he becomes incredibly convinced that this is you know, a, a viable solution to future smallpox epidemics. Um, he actually writes his friend in 1716 in England and promises that he would be ready to promote inoculation if smallpox ever visited the city again. Um, he's also, of course, becomes aware of some discussions in England um, about introducing smallpox inoculation because of the experience of the wife of a British ambassador in the Ottoman Empire who had observed the technique. So when smallpox returns in 1721, Mather writes an address to the physicians of Boston, and he urges them to try this inoculation technique. And in doing so, he records what the testimony that he received was from enslaved Africans. I'm not gonna read the quote to you word for word um, for various reasons, but you can see that 
I, I think it's worth pointing out here that Mather is careful to not mention Africans as the inventors of the inoculation. And I think that that's actually um, kind of important here. Even he isn't necessarily attributing this practice to their intelligence or to their ability to make empirical observations about their disease environment, to their collective knowledge through generations of observing a disease that is, um, they had far more experience than Europeans did, right? Um, instead, he sort of credits God, right, with teaching them this. Um, also, you might notice that he documents this testimony in the dialect, right? So his attempt to capture their creolized, Africans creolized English, a form of English that to many white settlers would have been denigrated and looked down upon as imperfect English, I think really kind of grates against our present day sensibilities, which is why I don't, I'm not gonna read it out loud. Um, but it, it's almost as if Mather thought that the sound of their speech would help to validate their testimony, right? To say, look, I got this from them. He also seems to attribute their trustworthiness to a kind of childlike simplicity as opposed to any form of expert knowledge, right? Um, so the question then becomes, can Africans be trusted as bearers of information that could guard against infection? Well, certainly Mather seems to have th thought so, um, unlike some of his peers who were of course the educated elite of the colonies who looked at African slaves as a highly dubious source of medical expertise, this particular minister did seem persuaded, um, maybe by the consistency of their one story, also perhaps by the sincerity that he seemed um, to, to find in their storytelling. However, most people are not convinced. Ultimately, he only manages to recruit one physician to his side. And it's an individual by the name of Zabdiel Boylston, who basically goes on to inoculate two enslaved Africans and then inoculate his own son. And um, he announces that this was successful. Well, the rest of the doctors and councilmen and elite governing elite of the public are horrified. Um, William Douglas, who is a doctor with um, who is the only man in the city with a medical degree, and he won't let anyone forget it. Um, he points out that inoculation remained untested, um, doesn't hold up to scientific scrutiny, but also steeped in the anti-Black racism of the time really saw a conspiracy. And he starts claiming that this is a conspiracy for Africans to kill their slavers by tricking them into infecting themselves um, with smallpox. And there's a local newspaper that is belonging to none other than Benjamin Franklin's older brother um, that actually agrees with Douglas and he begins spreading the word of this alleged conspiracy. Opposition was so strong that Zabdiel Boylston, Cotton Mather's colleague, had to go into hiding and Mather and Boylston are completely vilified. Um, so why did Boston's colonists meet this proposal with such terror that you know, almost bordered on hysteria. Um, I think that there are multiple reasons. First of all, of course, as I already mentioned, the whole anti-Black racism, the whole idea that they are just trying to kill us, um, the idea that all Africans are liars is something that also shows up in these pamphlets. Um, again, anyone who studied early colonial America knows that early, early American colonists loved their pamphlets. So a lot of this carries out in the press, right? They pamp one person publishes a pamphlet, another person publishes a pamphlet, which is great for historians because we have this great record of these debates. But also they didn't understand how inoculation worked. So the notion of choosing to infect yourself with a potentially deadly pathogen, perhaps understandably seemed a bit crazy. So there's also this fear, right, of a new, not very well understood technology. And then there's the fear that it's coming from a source that we can't trust, right? And then on top of that, you also have religious ideas. So um, the idea that smallpox was a punishment for sin was incredibly salient in early colonial America. So why intervene in God's will? And then there's also the fact that quarantines were necessary. So if you're inoculating someone with um, smallpox, they're gonna get some kind of sickness, right? And that is 
could spread. So you still, there's a lot of needs for quarantine during this time. And this is negatively impacting people's livelihoods, right? So some of these issues I think you'll find are of course reminiscent of today's pandemic, right? So this controversy goes on um, for, you know, almost for pretty much the entire two years of the epidemic. Um, William Douglas and Cotton Mather attack each other in the press um, quite viciously. Um, Mather complains um, back and forth. And ultimately what we see happening is that um, Mather and Boylston are able to persuade a few people from getting to get inoculated. And in doing so, they're able to have some numbers, right? So they actually keep track of those who they inoculated um, and they're able to sort of see what the death rate is. And of the people that they managed to persuade to get inoculated, only 2% died. And the death rate of the white population that hadn't been inoculated and caught smallpox was 14%. Now I'll call your attention to the death rates for the inoculated and uninoculated un for black people was much higher. Well, higher anyways, um, which again is a trend that we see here in, in the COVID-19 pandemic, right? And, and quite unsurprising um, if you understand the social determinants of health. So by 1725, Boylston sails to London to give a report to the Royal Society of London about these inoculations that they performed. And um, they publish the results in local newspapers. And by 1759, you see um, Benjamin Franklin, who is responding to a request from a doctor in London for an update by reporting res results from a new smallpox outbreak in Boston. And again, you see, right, the death rates of those who are uninoculated is much higher. Um, so when it comes time for this 1764 epidemic to hit Boston, inoculation at this point had become much more accepted. And governor um, of Boston actually orders uh, a group of doctors to arrange for inoculation of colonial Bostonians. And then by 1777, as the Revolutionary War is just getting started, um, so was a new epidemic of smallpox. And General George Washington orders the Surgeon General of the Continental Army to inoculate all soldiers coming through Philadelphia. And then by 1789, you see the physician at Cape Coast Gap Castle, which was a slave fort in what is today Ghana, instructed to perform mass inoculations to save not only the slaving company's personnel, but also the enslaved African captives during an epidemic there. And you can see that clearly as inoculation um, gains public favor, right? As it becomes common practice, um, the deaths from smallpox go down, right? So in many ways, this is seen as a successful adoption of a important preventative medical technology. Now, I just wanna mention that you also, during this time, see colonial authorities beginning to restrict inoculation to licensed physicians of European descent only. So enslaved Africans who continued to practice smallpox inoculation amongst themselves, found themselves increasingly subject to con colonial control and oversight. You also see during this time, um, some experiments being done. Um, I think that it's easy to think of these inoculations as purely humanitarian efforts and to sort of see how these therapeutic experiments resulted in really important medical discoveries. But it's also important to keep in mind the uneven power dynamics here and the fact that there is something really inherently violent about forcibly inoculating enslaved people for the purpose of reproducing slave labor, right? Um, and then eventually, right before the turn of the century, you have a British doctor named Edward Jenner, who um, is following all of this new science about inoculation, of course. And he ends up popularizing a theory that 
actually was also already known to some lay people, primarily dairy farmers, that exposure to cowpox could also immunize people against smallpox. So because the vaccinia virus, that's the cowpox virus, and variola virus, the causative agent of smallpox, are all derived from a common ancestral virus, this means that providing someone introducing some bit of cowpox um, to a healthy person would actually provide immunity against smallpox and was considered safer in that cowpox usually didn't affect people as strongly as smallpox did. So this is actually how we end up getting the word vaccine. Um, he names this process of inoculating people with traces of cowpox vaccination. So the word vaccine is first referred, is first referring only to cowpox injections. Of course, we know that um, this term, of course, gets broadened and is applied to various injections that provide immunity against disease. So I just wanna say a few things here. Um, one is you might think, maybe, it might be reasonable to think that this could have led to a less dismissive attitude to um, African indigenous knowledge. Um, but I think you probably know the answer to this question um, and it unfortunately didn't. And this wouldn't be the last time that Africans making um, astute observations about the natural world and about their disease ecology was dismissed as fiction or untrustworthy or even superstition. So for example, Somali pastoralists associated the bite of the mosquito with fever long before Europeans discovered that malaria was caused by a um, protozoa parasite, right? Um, and you see Richard Burton writing in 1854 that Somali pastoralists making this connection between the bite of a mosquito and become, becoming ill with a fever was you know, pure superstition. Um, it wouldn't be until 1880 um, that a French doctor would discover the malaria parasite um, and win a Nobel Prize for it. And then in 1897, a British medical officer was credited with discovering that malaria was indeed carried by mosquitoes. But Somalis were not alone in this knowledge that mosquito bites caused malarial fevers. In fact, pastoralists throughout East Africa, Kenya and Tanzania certainly recognized the relationship between various types of insects and disease. Um, the tsetse fly, for example, is another disease vector in Africa. Um, the bite of that fly transmits sleeping sickness or trypanosomiasis. So East African pastoralists use their knowledge of the local ecology to navigate their herds through various types of pasture in ways that would avoid these kinds of vectors, disease vectors. So it's documented that Africans recognize the causal relationship, even if the causal mechanism wasn't known yet. And I'm also reminded of my own fieldwork experience and interviewing an Ethiopian chemist once who studies Ethiopian medicinal plants. And he told me that the ritualized practice of harvesting certain medicinal plants only at dawn was once dismissed as mere superstition, but that this is actually grounded in good scientific practice due to what he called the discovery of diurnal variation in the alkaloid content of medicinal plants. So in other words, many medicinal plants have stronger alkaloidal content, meaning that they're more medicinally potent in the morning than they are in the afternoon. So this Ethiopian scientist was quite impressed with this. And he told me, you know, we have to pay attention to these things and not be so quick to dismiss them outright. And I would even go further to suggest that even some of these esoteric, more ritualistic me uh, medicinal practices in Africa that have been only studied by scholars of culture or religion merit a kind of reevaluation as technology. So for example, researchers at Johns Hopkins have shown that burning frankincense, a resin from the Boswellia plant, which by the way is a common treatment for spiritual and mental illness in Ethiopia, 
actually activates ion channels in the brain to help alleviate anxiety and depression. So these new understandings of the impact of ritual on human biology also further calls attention to the need to not completely dismiss um, systems of knowledge that um, at face value seem incompatible um, with our understandings. So for example, recent biomedical research um, conducted at Harvard has shown that rituals actually trigger some specific neurobiological pathways that modulate bodily sensations. So in other words, even the performance of healing without any biomedically defined active ingredient can help produce positive health outcomes because of the ways in which rituals, that is to say sort of the sensory affective aesthetic components can create measurable changes in our neurochemistry. So I'll just conclude with some final thoughts before we open it up to further discussion and questions um, about what I think this history um, can kind of do for us today. First of all, I would say that I think that broadening our understanding of technology helps make way, um, make visible the ways in which Africans and other people from the global south at large designed technological solutions to address their daily concerns. And this opens up new possibilities for thinking about a host of African practices as technological innovation. Also, I think it's important that we come to you know, realize and, and even celebrate that what we call Western medicine, right, or what scholars in the medical humanities sometimes might call biomedicine, was actually co-created. So the history of smallpox inoculation is just one of many stories that really underscores how ideas and practices from other cultures have been assimilated into scientific epistemologies by various Western specialists, which raises some interesting questions, I think, about just how Western, Western science is. Also, I would suggest that denigrating or dismissing cultural knowledge and practices, um, particularly of historically marginalized groups, even when they contain valuable information, can contribute to an overall distrust of medical and scientific authority. So scientists, doctors, and public health specialists today, I know are very concerned, for example, with what we call vaccine hesitancy, right? That is sort of doubting or delaying an acceptance of the vaccine. And I would wanna sort of push back a little bit on the trend of pathologizing, um, particularly black people's vaccine skepticism, because while many might blame relatively lower vaccination rates in communities of color on vaccine hesitancy, there are other sort of things that we should sort of pay attention to. First, there are persistent barriers to access, right? So just even things like having the ability to take time off work, having access to childcare, having access to, to, to caregiving should you fall ill with a side effect. These are still issues for some people, but also issues of trust in government in the health system, which is rooted in historical experience is something really important to remember here. Certainly the history of malevolent medical experiment carried out on specific groups without their consent, like forced sterilization, which by the way happened in California well up into the 1970s. Um, of course, the infamous Tuskegee syphilis experiment. These are histories that many people of color have in their collective memory. And then many others have that alongside their own personal encounters with medical racism. I mean, we can point to, for example, the abysmal maternal mortality rate in this country as one of the things that many Black women have personal experiences with. So these historical experiences echo out into the wider public. And then lastly, finally, I will say a major factor for fueling vaccine skepticism that has less to do with individual behavior and more to do with our information ecology is the spread of disinformation, which of course we know social media companies have been terribly inadequate at tackling, but healthy information ecologies that actually encourage people to critically assess information and then integrate that new information without feeling like their entire worldview is challenged is something that's incredibly important. And I think that this kind of intellectual humility can begin with us 
right? As educators and as knowledge producers, it's important um, to have intellectual humility in academia, just as it's important in business, in politics, in religion. Um, we're better learners, we're better collaborators when we seek out opposing viewpoints. And it also correlates with higher levels of empathy. And these are all factors that contribute to a more engaged citizenry um, and a healthy culture of learning. So I would conclude with this sort of question. Remember William Douglas and his, you know, he was the arch rival of Cotton Mather, right? Just hated him, completely denigrated him in the press. He changed his mind once he saw the results and he was convinced and not only well, I will say this, he never liked Cotton Mather. They were never gonna be friends, but he at least started practicing inoculation and became a proponent of it, right? And I guess I would sort of wonder if that would even happen today, given the way that we are all so siphoned off in our information bubbles. So um, I think I'll leave it there and I open it up to um, a little hopefully lively discussion. So I'm not sure how the Q and A is, is handled, but <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Alex, would you like to lead the Q and A? Sure, I'll, I'll moderate. Um, who who spoke up a minute ago? Um, I did. Jacob, uh, Jacob go ahead. I'm a student. Oh, okay. Um, I, I came in a little late on the on the meeting, but inoculation. Can you? Well, what do you mean by inoculation again? Yeah. Great, yeah. So inoculation is the practice um, of, so to be clear, this was actually done with smallpox mostly, but also with another disease which you guys might be less familiar with, it's endemic to Africa called Yaws. But basically it's where someone who has an active infection would produce these sort of fluid filled pustules. And someone would actually take that sore and get pus from that sore and insert it into a cut of a healthy person in order to um, hopefully create a milder case of the illness because once you've had it you ha would have immunity. Okay, I see that makes sense. Yeah. Barrett, you have your hand up. Yeah, well first thank you. This was really fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, I was struck by the map of Africa that you showed that showed the different locations where inoculation yeah. was known to have happened. And there were some in the West and some in the East and then yeah. one down in South Africa. And I was just wondering, is there, do historians have any evidence as to whether, exactly, that's the one, as to whether um, it, it started in one area and spread to others or- That's a really good question, yeah. Different groups discovered it independently. Yeah. So um, I, I should start by saying that, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of research on um, pre-colonial smallpox inoculation um, practices. So as I understand it, the main source we have is through these European accounts, which of course come much later. Um, they oftentimes do describe the methods though, which is helpful. And so you see a lot of differing sort of, you, you see enough differences in the exact method to suggest that there might have been independent innovation here, right? So um, there, again, this is kind of an ongoing debate and there isn't enough research on it, but there is some suggestion that along the Horn of Africa and the East Coast of Africa, that it might have been a result of contact with Arab and Persian traders um, and the because there was an ongoing exchange between the Arab world and the Horn and the Swahili coast um, that dates back long before European arrival. And so you do see the, a lot of cultural interchange um, happening as a result of that. So some people have suggested that, you know, this clustering around the Horn and East Africa is sort of, you know, resonates with that. Um, that this, this would have been sort of along these various trade routes. Um, so that's one suggestion, um, but I, I don't think that there's any evidence that it, it transferred from say East Africa to West Africa in part because the methods would be a little bit different. Some of them would use 
the scabs, some of them would use the active pus, some of them would use different parts of the arm. And it's true that these changes could have happened over time, just naturally. Um, but we tend to sort of think that, that independent innovation is likely, um, but that there could also be some of this kind of like one group to another that happened um, through trade, particularly um, the Swahili coast trade and Indian Ocean trade, yeah. Before I get to a question in the chat, I want to follow up on that. You mentioned that it also had been observed in the Ottoman Empire. I would have thought that the Ottomans would have pretty extensive record keeping. What do we know about the uh, time in which yeah. the occupation was developed there? That's a great question, and I wish I could answer it for you, but I'm not a specialist in Ottoman Empire history. I could actually ask. Um, so. I do know that the evidence we have for it being practiced in the Ottoman Empire does come from some um, manuscripts. Yeah, so I do know that there is written documentation of that that dates at least to the 16th, 17th century that are Ottoman, actually Ottoman um, uh, manuscripts. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Um, and one that I think that an expert in the Ottoman Empire would be better qualified to answer. But I'm, I'm actually interested in I, something I want to follow up on with my colleagues. Yeah. I mean, just the fact that it's apparently so widespread in East Africa, which is somewhat closer to Ottoman lands, seems at least yeah. suggestive of some so sort of communication I, there. Yeah, you know, I, I'm less inclined to think that the transference from Turkey to East Africa makes sense and more inclined to think that the Arab and Persian transfer to um, East Africa makes more sense because of the direct contact and the long-standing interchanges. However, it's also possible that there could be this Arab, Turkey, Africa, right? So it's it's a little bit difficult um, for me to say without more information about the Ottoman sources, um, but I, I'm less inclined to think that it makes sense that there would be a direct transfer from Turkey to East Africa than there would be from the Arab world, yeah. All right, um, before I get to another uh, hand that's up, there's a question in the chat from Dennis Nielsen. Uh, why is it that the history books, or maybe I should say the history books that those of us who aren't historians who only learn about this in K through 12, why is it that the K through 12 lessons only talk about Edward Jenner and none of the precursors. So the question is why, why are we focused on Edward Jenner and we don't ever learn about these earlier practices? I mean, I think that this, for me personally, as an Africanist, I will say that this points to the need to, to teach pre-colonial African history as part of world history. Um, and not a separate, um, you know, not a separate entity. Um, Pre-colonial Africa was deeply integrated into the global economy. Um, you know, uh, it was it was a very cosmopolitan and highly globalized place. And I think that there is a real need to teach pre-colonial Africa as part of world history, and um, and it's not yet happening. <laughs> I do it when I teach world history, um, but you know that's at the college level. So in terms of how this trickles down to K through 12 curriculum, um, yeah, that's a really important question. Um, I know some Africanists who have been involved in um, producing um, great classroom material for K through 12 classrooms, um, mostly for sort of secondary though, right? Secondary education. These are folks that are mostly producing stuff for high schools. Um, and that's something that I'm also very much interested in. So at least that we can kind of have lesson plans and material available that is open source for K through 12 teachers um, to, to get. So they don't have to sort of, you know, go and, and get graduate training in African history. They can just sort of rely on lesson plans that are developed by experts. Um, and so this is a project that I'm actually interested in. Then I wanna ask a follow-up on that before I get to Alice Tokunaga. Um, Given that there is, there's a tiny bit of attention to African American history in K through 12. I mean, it's a very select canon, but it's there. There's a tiny handful of names that everyone learns. Why isn't Onesimus one of those names? Yeah, another great question. Um, 
he's known in Boston. <laughs> I, 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 did, I did find um, that there was some, I don't know, there was some sort of some gesture that the city of Boston made, um, which is nice, right? And, and maybe he does get taught in Boston public schools. I don't know. I'm, I'm from California, um, Bay Area. So um, certainly I did not learn anything really about um, personally, you know, myself, really about African-American contributions to science and um, to our nation generally, really, until high school, personally. So I think that, you know, again, that there is a real need to think about um, not just, you know, um, pre-colonial Africa being taught as part of world history, but also as African-American contributions or African-American history being taught as part of American history, right? And not as a separate thing that we do when it's Black History Month, but actually as part of the formation of this, of this, this country. And I would also suggest as something other than just an object of slavery, right? That there are we, when we talk about African contributions to the, um, to the Americas, um, we can talk about it as something that's not just, right, not just their labor that they provided. They provided their knowledge, their expertise um, as well. All right, then Alice Tokunaga has a question. Yes. Can well, I jump so in also? Oh, sorry. Hello? Oh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for their very interesting talk. Um, I actually wanted to know, um, so you mentioned the Ottoman Empire, you don't really know much about it. I, I heard that um, in the harems, they used to inoculate the women um, with the scabs. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds, that makes sense to me. Um, yeah. Like I said, they there were, again, there were different methods. So um, I think that you're, I think, yeah, the Ottoman might have waited for the, the sword to scab over and then they like ground up. Is this what you heard? Would they grind um, the, the scabs yeah, into like a kind of powder? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. And then yeah. Um, there was still, you know, a high level of mortality, I think. Um, well, my, my actual question was um, like what? So you know how um, tuberculosis is supposed to have come from pr close proximity with cows and um, so is smallpox related to cows because of the cowpox? And yeah, well, so um, this is where I'm also slightly out of my area of expertise because I'm not a virologist, but, but, but I, yes, they're, they are relative. I'm, I'm not, my understanding is that they seem to be derived from a common ancestor. Right, so not necessarily that smallpox derived directly from cowpox, but they may be both descended from a common ancestor. One set of mutations made it more effective at infecting cows. Another set of mutations made it more effective at infecting humans. So I don't know if that sort of yeah helps. yeah thank yeah. you <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Um. There was someone else who wanted to jump in before I give uh, Jacob a second question. We'll have to see about the time. Who was it that wanted to jump, who tried to jump in a second ago? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, with reference to the Ottoman Empire, uh, I'm a historian of microbiology, also a Cal Poly graduate. And uh, I am not a specialist by any means in the history of the Ottoman Empire. But I had taught my students uh, pretty routinely that uh, the whole business of variolation is uh, clearly uh, established in an early period uh, of what we would have called Anatolia, or now Turkey, uh, back into the 14th century, most likely. And that in fact, uh, uh, that wasn't mentioned at the beginning of the uh, of the talk, which was a wonderful one, by the way, and thank you. Uh, I just wondered why that wasn't brought up, uh, because it's been my belief, at least, that uh, that it's a uh, a Turkish invention. Uh, one can go from there and see what we can do with that. But uh, uh, again, thank you so much, and. Uh, uh, let's talk more about the Turkish connection if we can. Thank yeah, you. Ab absolutely. I, you know, I'm pretty curious to know what the source is. I, it, it, it may, like I said, I think that these 
practices are far older than the sources that we have available. Um, I only know of the reports from um, Turkey that were coming from the British folks that were there, right, which came in the 18th century. But my understanding is that it is a far older practice. So I didn't mean to sort of um, suggest that it's dated from that time period. I also believe that it's far older in Africa as well than the sources we have available. Um, there is, I think we would have to look at indigenous sources, right? So in terms of the Ottoman Empire, we would have to look at Turkish sources. Um, in terms of Africa, again, we would have to look at African sources um, in order to see, you know, in order to properly date them. Um, so yeah, I'd be interested to know um, what the 14th century source was, if you if you um, are willing to share in the chat, I'd be very, very interested, yeah. All right, well, it's after five. Um, I don't know, Dean Baskey, do we, do we have time for one more question or do we need to wrap this up? Why don't we do our last question and then wrap it? Okay, Jacob, go ahead. Okay, well, it was kind of two questions now because, uh, uh, well, because I, I, I did come in late, so I apologize yeah. for that. I was no just curious about the flow of the spread of the uh, on that map, actually. Like, what if you could just go over uh, again? Because yeah. talk about the trade and and why the left side circles, I guess. Because yeah. So I was circling the, 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 the regions in West Africa because that was pertinent to our discussion about transference across the Atlantic, right? Because um, generally speaking, East Africans were not um, forcibly transported across the Atlantic in the transatlantic slave trade. So in terms of sort of connecting um, pre-colonial African practices to the practice of enslaved Africans, that's why. Um, and in terms of like the dispersal of practices, it's not clear that, you know, it was a one to one kind of exchange, like it started here and it spread to there and spread to there. Um, as I mentioned um, earlier in the Q&A, it's very likely that there's independent innovation happening, right? Um, you see this with other technologies, for example, iron forging um, was independently innovated in East Africa and West Africa. And we know this because of different methods and so forth, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, with that, I think we should wrap up. Um, but uh, thank you so much. Uh, Professor Hill, for your time today, I I certainly learned a lot. I can tell from the <laughs> questions in chat that a lot of other people did as well. And this is clearly a story that we all need to learn much more of because it is very, very, very relevant to everything going on right now. So let's all thank Professor yeah. Hill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure.